I've gone into a lot of different industries. I've talked to people in many different fields and I've never encountered just the sort of reticence. I really felt like there was a sense in which the art world views secrecy as key to its survival. I'm Ben Davis, and this is The Art Angle, the podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. The contemporary art world is nothing if not confusing. It is simultaneously deeply frivolous and takes itself way too seriously. Its business dealings combine total mystification with conspicuous consumption. And the exact mechanisms by which one type of art gets celebrated above another are very often impossible to figure out. If you've ever struggled to make sense of it all, the journalist Bianca Bosker's new book is worth picking up. It's called Get the Picture, a mind-bending journey among the inspired artists and obsessive art fiends who taught me how to see. And it joins books like Anthony Hayden Guest's classic True Colors from 1998 and Sarah Thornton's Seven Days in the Art World from 2008 as an entertaining behind-the-scenes chronicle of art though in a very different and maybe even more confusing moment. Bosker previously wrote original copies about architecture in China that replicates famous world monuments and Cork Dork, where she went inside the world of fine wine to try to decode its rituals. For Get the Picture, Bosker inserted herself in the striving, less visible layers of the art industry, just beneath the glamorous images. She works the booth at a satellite fair in Miami, where a gallery's survival hinges on a few sales, and as a studio assistant for a painter whose success becomes a major headache as speculators start flipping her work. And there's a lot more. In some ways, get the picture will confirm all your worst stereotypes about the contemporary art industry. In others, it's the story of someone who slowly learns how to look past the stereotypes by throwing herself into the thick of it, finding her own way to appreciate some of art's more eccentric values. Bianca Bosker, thank you for coming on The Art Angle to talk about this book. Thank you so much for having me. So you previously wrote this book called Cork Dork, which was a bestseller and a big deal where you went inside the world of fine Wine. This book is about the art world. What made you want to give the cork dork treatment to the world of contemporary art? Well, I think similarly, what brought me into this world was feeling like I didn't understand it. Art had been a passion of mine growing up. There was a time where I like dreamed of applying to art school and then grew up a little bit. I started pursuing jobs and classes in college that would kind of get me into a career that came with a dental plan. And I moved to New York City and I started with this vague idea that if I didn't make art, at least I would go and see it and appreciate it. And that was until I actually started seeing art on a regular basis. And I don't know if anyone listening to the show has had this experience, but, you know, I would like go into these impeccable rooms with their, you know, white walls and intense lighting and hushed ambiance and squeaky floors and like turn this corner and discover a bunch of people gravely contemplating, I don't know, like a sculpture of limp vegetables on a stained mattress. (laughs) And I felt like everyone got the punchline except me. And I guess I kind of took the coward's way out. I withdrew. I mean, for a long time, Art and I were not on speaking terms. I felt like I didn't understand what was going on and it wasn't for me. And I don't know that that would have changed, except I had this discovery when I was back at my childhood home in Oregon, helping my mom clean out her basement And I got really fixated on this concern that by turning my back on art, I was missing out on something big. And so I decided I would try again. I sort of started poking around the art world again, going to galleries and museums. And if I'm being totally honest, the art that I was seeing was, to me, kind of barely recognizable as art, still really befuddled me. But the people fascinated me. I'd never met a group of people willing to sacrifice so much for something of so little obvious practical value. I'm sure you've come across them, right? Like artists who treat hundred-year-old paintings like they're as necessary as vital organs, gallerists who max out multiple credit cards because they can show these like humps of metal they think will change the world. And I was surprised to discover that scientists are really right there with artists in declaring art a fundamental part of our humanity as one biologist puts it, as necessary to us as food or sex. I didn't know the feeling, but I will say I was also really intrigued by the way that these art fiends approached 
not just art, but the world. Like they had this expansive approach to life that really made my own existence feel claustrophobic by comparison. And to be fair, they pitied me. You know, they told me that I lacked visual literacy, which they said was downright dangerous in a world so saturated with images. And I just quickly became consumed with this question of whether I could see art and whether I could see the world the way they did. And so I decided I would try and throw myself into the nerve center of the fine art world to see what I could learn. Unfortunately, not a lot of people initially thought that was a particularly good idea. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that the book is like, in the end, sort of pro-art, but anti-art world. I think a lot of people, including myself, will be sympathetic to this perception of kind of a mean girl's world, you know, kind of complete with its own burn book and all this <laughs> stuff, you know, really feeling like you're around the cool kids who um, don't want to tell you where the party is later because you're not cool enough. I think parts of it, like I think that as everyone always repeated to me, like their art world is so small, but there are so many art worlds. And I think that, you know, it took me a while to sort of find the community of people to sort of find what I would describe as the sort of rebel alliance of artists, but also galleries, curators who really believed that art, even cutting edge art is for everyone, that it is not a luxury, it's a necessity, that you don't have to have several advanced degrees to engage with it, right? That everything you need to have a meaningful experience of art is right in front of you. I think there is that group out there. But yes, at the same time, I will say that I did experience the mean streak of the art world as well. (laughs) And still, I think ultimately, I actually think of the book as a love story. You know, it has all the sort of agony and ecstasy that often goes along with love. So this is a question I have for you, just to frame the whole thing. So this is a book where you... Don't just report on the art world, but you embed with the art world in various capacities. Like you become a guard at the Guggenheim Museum. You become an assistant director at a gallery. You curate a show and you're really trying to learn by doing. But I do wonder, and it comes up a couple times in the book, there is a sort of aura of secrecy to the art world and exclusivity and you know, no one wants to talk about how the deals are really done for a lot of reasons you talk about. But on the other hand, there is just a little issue that you're a reporter. So how much of your interactions with the various figures you embedded with do you think was shaped by the fact that you were writing the exact kind of book you're writing? Because when I read about how, you know, I think you talk about, you know, I had an easier time sniffing out answers in Chengdu, China than in Chelsea. I think, well, well yeah, but she's like, I mean, You can Google her name and and you know what she's up to, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, look, I think I consider myself a very passionate generalist. I mean, I've written about everything from witches to supermarkets. And yet I will say that even as a journalist, I mean, the paranoia, the secrecy, the fear that I encountered in the art world was on a totally different level. I've gone into a lot of different industries. I've talked to people in many different fields and... I've never encountered just the sort of reticence. I really felt like there was a sense in which the art world views secrecy as key to its survival. And for people that haven't read the book, you're right. Like I am a journalist and like a lot of journalists, I do interviews, I read research reports, I read books, all kinds of things. But I do also believe, as you said, in learning by doing. And Having now done it, I will say there is a very big difference between a gallerist politely telling you the sort of nice answer to how they sell an artwork. And it is another to spend eight hours a day during Art Basel in Miami Beach schmoozing with millionaires and then selling you know, thousands of dollars worth of art from the backseat of an Uber while people are doing cocaine around you. Which happened to you, just to be Which clear. Happened. We'll get yes. into it in just a second. <laughs> I say this from experience. Um, and I will say that, you know, to me, I feel like understanding how things work often also reveals why they matter. I mean, to me, I really wanted to understand, like, how does art go from being this germ of an idea in someone's studio to this quote-unquote masterpiece that we obsess over in museums? Because all the decisions that shape that artwork are also decisions that shape us, right? Our idea of what art is, who makes it, why we should bother to engage with it. And I felt like getting answers to the fundamental questions at the core of our relationship with art really meant being in the middle of the action, being in the room. Now, I agree that not every journalist does this. I think that for me, like based on everything I'd sort of understood from a distance about the art world, I did expect people to be more welcoming, you know, to sort of have this Mm -hmm. 
free-spirited mindset that they just wanted to embrace as many people in the warm hug of art as possible. I mean, this is an industry where we applaud someone for canning their own shit for a sculpture, right? <laughs> like they tend to think differently, to try new things. And yet, you know, when I started telling people my plan, their reaction was, this is impossible, maybe even dangerous. Not yeah. a good idea for you if you want to keep living your life in New York, basically. And what I will say is that, of course, you know, a journalist is there to learn things and then share them. But I was taken aback by the extent to which the secrecy permeates this world so that even the people in it don't have a good sense of how it works and why things happen the way they do. You know, I started doing studio visits with artists and these are people who have spent much more time in the world than I have, who have much more at stake. And yet even they didn't understand kind of basic elements of how to build a life for themselves in their chosen career. And I found that off-putting. I found that a bit disturbing. And it felt like this opacity was deliberate and also injurious to the people within it, people that were not even journalists. Yeah, it's like playing a game where no one's explained the rules to you. And if you can figure it out, you have to figure it out by playing the game, sometimes for very high stakes with a lot to lose. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to understand these questions for myself. And so I'd sit down with artists and ask them, you know, how do you get a show? And an artist who'd spent 12 years trying to do exactly that, living in New York, was like, I don't know, right? <laughs> or, you know, I was like, how does one piece end up in a show over another? And, you know, another artist would be like, I'm still trying to figure that out. And this was someone who actually ran their own gallery on the side and worked at galleries on the side. So I think that I began to experience, as I eventually started working with galleries, what I would describe as the strategic snobbery that the art world wields to keep people out. And I certainly don't think it's necessary, but I think it exists and it's very pervasive and powerful. Right. So let's get into your into the art world. Like you said, there are many art worlds and you have to find a very way into a very specific art world. And normally what gets the attention is like the biggest galleries, the headline, the artists who you know are in all the museums and their name makes news on its own. And because you're trying to find your way into this world, you have to find your way into the place where people would find their way into the art world, which is at the lower rungs. And so you got to get a picture of some things and some of the dynamics that people don't often talk about. So tell me about your experience at Jack Barrett Gallery, or I guess it was 315 Gallery at the time you started working there. He was the first person who gave you a chance to actually work in this world. I would say that from the beginning, I was really drawn to the world of up-and-coming, emerging artists and the people who work with them. To me, that is really the highest stakes and least covered part of the world. It also felt like a way to get beyond the romanticized, sanitized version of art history that we often hear. And I think by the time that people reach these mega galleries and these museums, I mean, first of all, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like what's at stake there is really like how many zeros do we add to the price tag? And at the <laughs> same time, the story all makes sense. Like all the edges have sort of been worn off. And I think at the emerging level, like that feels like where people are really still in this bloody business of trying to elbow their way into the industry, into art history. And I wanted to see that in action. I wanted to see how that works. So after a lot of closed doors, after a lot of people refusing to talk to me after various threats. I did succeed in getting a gig working, you know, this very cool up and coming gallery in Brooklyn. And it was a revelation. I mean, it was really a crash course for me in art and looking at it and in connoisseurship and in the way the world and the market works. And I think, as I said before, it was also my entryway into understanding some of the deliberately erected barriers to entry that keep out the Joe Schmoes, which is my boss's term for general public. And I personally experienced some of the feedback that, you know, went along with sort of figuring out how you fit Yeah, you do not get along with this dealer. I don't um, know if I would put it in those words. Not to spoil anything. I mean, if, he is, if there's a foil in this book, it's Jack Barrett um, who comes in for a rough treatment. In I a way. would phrase differently. I learned a lot. I am very grateful for that experience. But I received, let's say, some coaching on how I needed to adjust my bearing, my wardrobe, some of my language, 
to better fit in. And again, I don't think that's just me. You know, I spoke with artists who told me that they felt pressure to develop this carefully honed, quote unquote, artist personality in order to fit in in the art world, to be sort of flamboyant or strange or eccentric. But yes, you know, I was told one afternoon that you are not the coolest cat in the art world. So having you around it's just like lowering my coolness. So it was suggested that I could use perhaps a makeover, you know, severe haircut, no jewelry. It was suggested that it wouldn't be bad if I toned down some of my superficial enthusiasm, as I'm sure you have experienced perhaps on this very podcast. You know, many seasoned art connoisseurs tend to go into this default voice when they talk about art, which basically is this affectless monotone that makes them sound like they're running out of batteries. Kind of NPR voice, yeah. (laughs) Um, Language, of course, right? I was not to say that a work had been sold. It had been placed. It was not a website, but an online viewing room. You know, really, I was encouraged to develop fluency in art speak. And I think, as you probably know, like art speak, if you've heard it, is not designed for clear communication. I love this study of art press releases that found that the words spatial and non-spatial get used interchangeably. But art speak is really this exclusionary code that distinguishes you as someone who does or does not get it. And then, of course, you know, it goes beyond that. Like, I think where galleries are located. I mean, I kept noticing as you go around the city in New York, but, you know, I was talking to someone in New Mexico who said it's very similar there as well, and I think this applies to many art hubs, These galleries are really located less like stores than speakeasies, right? They're like up a flight of stairs and they're tucked away in these buildings that could just as easily house departments. Maybe there's like a business card size nameplate that like probably emits helpful words like art or gallery. And yes, ground level storefronts are expensive, but you know, as one dealer explained to me, being on a ground level storefront is also actively undesirable because then you deal with quote unquote random ass people walking in. Then there's just the sort of general view that straightforwardness is uncouth. Being borderline hostile is cool. There was a gallerist who was like, no, 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 it's okay. Like really like collectors like want you to be a little rude to them. And if you have ever tried to inquire, let's say about the price of an artwork, which tends not to be shared, you will probably have gone through a schmo detector test, right? Like you ask a question about the work and in turn, the gallerist then asks you, what else do you own? How do you make your money? I worked with a dealer who recoiled at selling to people who worked in certain sectors of finance. So this whole sense that like, while you are judging the work, you are yourself being judged. And I think that that strategic snobbery I said, keeping the general public at arm's length is ultimately a way to build mystique. It's a way to concentrate power in the hands of gatekeepers. It's a way to sort of maintain this view of the art world as this exclusive purview of a self-anointed few. Again, not everyone espouses to these beliefs or uses these techniques, but I did feel like as I began working in galleries, I was being initiated into the hidden logic of the art world. My hope, I guess, is that explaining sort of how the machine works, people can both navigate it better and we may be able to find a better way. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's actually sort of your book suggests a kind of inverted hierarchy because talking about Jack Barrett Gallery, this is like as small of a gallery as you can imagine. I mean, you were the only person working for him. Other than that, it's a guy who takes out his own trash and selling paintings for thousands of dollars, not tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And yet, yeah, it has this very highly developed kind of sense of itself as an exclusive kind of cool kids spot. You talk at a certain point about him saying, you know, people are only really looking for recognition within the art world and talking about media outlets to reach out to. And he's like, well, I, I would like to be written about by art magazines. You can reach out to the New York Times, but I don't really care about that. Part of that to me reads like cope, you know, what the kids call cope. is It's like, of course, the less your financial capital, the more you lean on uh, cultural capital in order to get you over the finish line. Sort of one definition of a hipster, really, is someone who compensates for their lack of real capital with cultural capital. How much of it do you think is that? At the lower rungs, what the people have is their identity as the cool kids to lure people in. I think certainly there's an element of that. I think that's an interesting observation. I also think, though, that when we talk about money in the art world, 
it's complicated, right? There was an artist I met with who describes the art world as really running on what she would call magic money. Oh, I wanted to ask you about magic money. Right. And it's sort of this idea that like, when you look at what people are doing, how they are spending their time, where they live, how they dress, the math doesn't quite add up. And so what makes it work is what she calls magic money. Which is to be clear, like, Somebody is taking out their own trash, but actually has a house in the Hamptons or a trust fund or something like that. You know, that there's money when you need Mm, it. Right, right. There's this like magical treasure chest, essentially, (laughs) that materializes. Which is important. I think people don't talk about that enough, about the actual, again, yeah, one of the things I think is useful about this book. Yeah, certainly. And so, you know, I think that when you go to galleries in New York, really anywhere, I mean, look, it's like ostensibly the business model is it's a business. You put art on the walls and you sell it. You get money that then allows you to pay the rent and pay your rent and so on and so forth. But in reality, in New York, and again, elsewhere, you will go to these places where nothing is for sale or, you know, maybe things are nominally for sale, but they're not actually selling anything. And yet they exist month after month after month. And I think that there's this real tension. I mean, you have probably heard, you know, this term pure in the art world. And pure is kind of the sense that like, you're not just selling what the pure would dismissively refer to as couch art or colorful paintings, but you know, you're showing market unfriendly work or you're showing, you know, fuck you art that's difficult and doesn't play nicely at a dinner party. And there's this sort of, you know, sense that the pure are above crass matters like money. You say in Jack's circle, the highest praise was to be pure and the pure treated money like diarrhea, a fact of life, but gross. I thought that was nice. (laughs) Yeah, it's gross. If you have it, you don't talk about it. You know, I was really struck by talking with artists who couldn't afford to be pure. You know, they would show their work with a gallery run by a generous, wealthy, you know, minor European royal who didn't care about frivolous things like selling the work, right? And so I think that there's just all of these hidden layers and dynamics that don't often get discussed. Yeah, it's something people talk about in the restaurant world. It's really hard to compete in the restaurant world because so many of them are vanity restaurants. And I think it's really the same in the art world. You were at Jack Barrett in its process of becoming Jack Barrett and moving. You have some very amusing accounts of that. What years were this? How long were you there? How did it end? So I started the journey that became Get the Picture in 2018. So it has been many years in the making. There's a lot of research that I did that didn't directly make it into the pages of the book, but felt nonetheless vital to reaching a conclusion about the things I did, to informing my perspective, to being able to write a single sentence with confidence. So I worked with a number of other artists than the ones I specifically focus on in the book itself, you know, just put on a lot of other pathways. But yeah, this time I spent with Jack was a period of several months. After you in that relationship, you become a gallery associate at Denny Domin Gallery. And in general, that's a more positive experience for you. What did you appreciate about that gallery? What did you learn there? Yeah, I mean, look, it was just, it was a different experience. Like, I was really grateful. This is another smallish gallery. It actually closed in 2023. But you put in the book, a rung up the ladder. Yeah, you know, artists a few years further out from grad school, price tags with another zero or so on them. You know, I think that my time with Jack really helped me understand the primacy of the role of context in the art world today. And I do believe this journey for me was in no small part about developing my eye, this sort of painstakingly cultivated outlook that for connoisseurs, you know, it allegedly enables us to see a lot that doesn't meet the eye. Like, you know, who's going to be the next Basquiat? Or like, what is transcendent about a sculpture of decaying vegetables on a stained mattress? And for me, there was something very frustrating about the focus on context. You know, part of it, I think, came from my own experience in the wine world. You know, when I was training as a sommelier as part of the book Cork Dork, We did a lot of blind tasting and blind tasting is really about sitting in front of a glass of wine. You don't know anything about it. You have to ignore all the things that are designed to play to your sensory biases and just stay true to your own felt experience of something. You can't think about price. You can't think about these like external things. 
And it was sort of jarring to then step into the art world and feel like so many of the art connoisseurs that I was getting to know spent surprisingly little time discussing the merits of the artworks themselves. And instead they asked questions like, where did the artist go to school? Who else owns the work? Who is he sleeping with? Who are her friends? And that was the context, right? That web of names around an artist, a sort of social capital that goes along with the artist. And again, there was something jarring for me about being told essentially, as opposed to with wine, you know, it's all about the glass and what you experience of it. With art, I was sort of being told, nope, not about what you think, not about what you're feeling, but instead it's about all of this other information that I had erroneously, I suppose, thought was extraneous to judging the work, to having a conversation with the artwork. I think that there was something frustrating to me because I felt like I was being encouraged to outsource my eye to the hive mind. And I think that emphasis on context also felt like one more way to keep out the schmolitariat because these connoisseurs become so much more vital to the system, to our experience of art, if we're told that we can't really understand what's going on unless we use the right art speak, have several master's degrees, and spend years going to art fairs memorizing artists' backgrounds and biographies. Danny Dimon, I mean, the experience was incredible on so many different levels, but I think that one thing that really drew me to them was their emphasis on staying in the work. So I ended up going with them to the Untitled Art Fair during our Basel Miami Beach. And it was wild. I spent months experiencing the pure, and now I was thrown into the puerile, you know, this like bacchanal of like powders, pills, parties, beats, all held in the name of shopping for art. And as I was trying to, you know, sell these photographs and sort of keep up and actually contribute to helping it not be a, just a totally like ruinous financial trip, Elizabeth Denny, who then ran the gallery, really was encouraging me to sort of dismiss context, to just have an experience with the work, to help people themselves stay in the work. I ended up continuing to work with the gallery after we got back from Miami. And I felt like rather than trying to sort of foist someone else's opinion and taste on me, they were really trying to encourage people to develop their own. Although I guess they did, you know go out of business. <laughs> so maybe uh, that proves that uh, the art world is a little more in thrall of those kind of context networks than is tenable in some ways for the kind of connoisseurship you're advocating. And I should say in the book, you do an amazing job of talking to them about, you know, the financials of it. And you're talking to Elizabeth Denny. It was like, no, I want people to know how shitty yeah. this is. You know, this is a terrible business. <laughs> and you get Rob Demon's salary on the record. You know, it's 45K a year plus commission. And a lot of people will be thinking you cannot live in New York on that. Right. And I think it's important to spell out. But yeah, look, I just think that there are so many different ways of engaging with art. I think that for me, the guiding questions for my journey were sort of like, why does art matter and how do any of us engage with it more deeply? But there are, of course, many answers to those questions. I hope readers agree that I have provided many answers to those questions in the book. That being said, I do think that personally, my own experience of art really took on a new dimension and a new joy when I was able to move away from the emphasis on context. And I think that began to happen at Denny Dimon, but it was a process that really clicked once I started working with artists in their studios. I think that that was an experience that really helped me figure out how to savor work like an artist. And that really, for me, meant slowing down. It meant paying attention to the physical form. It meant examining the decisions that an artist makes. And I also think in some ways it was a veer off course from what I experienced to be the dominant narrative in the art world, which was that it's really the idea behind a piece that matters. Like the thought trumps the thing. I think we hear that a lot. I think, you know, we're sort of living in the aftermath of Marcel Duchamp. And nonetheless, when you watch artists at work, like making art is practically athletic. I mean, it's this bloody, blistery business. You know, I ended up working with the artist, Julie Curtis, who, as she told me, you know, an idea is not a painting. Painting is constant decision-making. And when you are around artists, when you, you hear them talking about their work, you know, they're not like philosophizing exactly. I mean, occasionally, maybe, I mean, they're just incredibly well-read 
group of people. You know, I felt out of my league a lot. That's partially why the bibliography includes as many books as it does. I felt like there was a lot of art history knowledge and art theory I needed to catch up on. But still, I think when you get artists together, they talk about like, well, how do you prime your canvas? How many times do you sand it? You know, are you using this like marble dust to prime it? Are you using like this or that? Do you varnish at the end? What kind of varnish? When? How soon? And I just think that for me, that experience of seeing artists at work enabled me to find my own pathway into the piece. I think, yeah, your time as Julie Curtis's studio assistant is really important and maybe the most transformative part of the book for your journey. But I did want to say, up to about a page 150 in this book, I was a little worried about it. You know, I was a little worried that this was going to be a version of Tom Wolfe's The Painted Word from 1975 about how the art world is too much into text and not enough into the object. And then, yeah, you go to the art fair in Miami, which... You quote somebody saying it's the bourgeois indulgence that comes before a communist revolution. Love that quote. And is usually considered the heart of darkness. But I think it's a fascinating thing in the book that it actually kind of opens you up. There is this thing where you did slow down to see artists make art, but then you also sped up and got this huge injection of art that you can get at an art fair with all its corrupt aspects. And I highlighted this passage at the end. By the end of that fair, that weekend, you say... um, Like a lot of contemporary art, these pieces made me feel as if somebody had kicked out my legs from under me. But that helpful grasping feeling had stopped being painful. It was a rush. Unknown artworks were a challenge, a dare. And for the first time, I could remember I didn't want to back down. So I just did want to say that because I think that's kind of a remarkable thing about this book, too. That by the kind of process of seeing that scene around art does kind of like open you up to all these different ways of thinking about beauty or the inspiration of the art experience that weren't what you went into. Totally. And I think that art fairs are often treated as sort of the butt of the joke. I mean, I think how often does anyone celebrate an art fair? You know I mean? They're sort of kind of dismissed as sort of like these ridiculous kind of tasteless displays. And look, they are overwhelming. They are overstimulating, but also they enable many artists to keep making work. I mean, I do think that, you know, at the end of it, it's like we were lucky enough to have sold a great number of pieces of artwork. And as the artist Sean Fader told me as he came up, he was like, you know, that enables artists to keep working. That enables the gallery to keep their doors open. So I think that, first of all, we can't just bury our heads in the sand when it comes to the financial element of it. And I think, secondly, you know, it was an incredible way for me to develop my eye. I mean, I just saw so much. And I think... That was sort of the beginning for me of a real kind of identity crisis with my own sense of taste. Like, I think that I probably came into the fair preferring things more on the sort of like colorful painting, couch art spectrum. And I came out of it like craving weird boundary pushing artwork of the sort that I would have, I don't know, turned my back on not so long before. And, you know, I think that at the same time, I don't want to dismiss the value of beauty. I think that I had this experience when I was selling Erin O'Keefe's photographs at Denny Dimmon's booth during Untitled Miami, where I began to realize that beauty is contrary to what a lot of people in the art world would tell you, is not our sworn enemy. You know, I think there is this idea that has persisted for the last century or so in the art world, but also, I think, in polite society more broadly, that beauty is suspect. It is corrupted and corrupting and falling for its charms is essentially a sign of moral weakness. I disagree. I think that, you know, we may think that we're done with beauty, but beauty is definitely not done with us. Beauty is arguably something biological. We have these innate aesthetic preferences that seem to hold consistent, not only across different groups of humans, different cultures, places, demographics, but also across different species. You know, we have this preference for like curved shapes for a certain degree of symmetry that we share with, I think it's certain monkeys, maybe squirrels, rats, something like that. Anyway, I also think that that's not to say that beauty is always the visual equivalent of a vanilla cupcake. One of the ways that this journey to art really changed me is I think that art has enabled me to see beauty in so many more places than I ever did before. And Mm -hmm. like working with Julie Curtis, like 
I came to recognize the beauty of the shit tits at the sewage treatment plant in Brooklyn. She's big, round structures that are near her studio. Yes, they look sort of like silver, pendulous, alien egg things, and they're filled with sewage. They're also beautiful. And I think that beauty doesn't have to be something physical. I mean, we've argued for thousands of years over what beauty is. I mean, the whole concept of beauty is a total mess. I came to think that beauty doesn't have to be something physical. It doesn't necessarily exist in certain proportions, but beauty is just that moment where where our mind jumps the curve, you know, where we're pulled deeper into life. And I think that that denial of beauty that exists in many corners of the art world is nihilistic. You know, I think there's something wonderfully optimistic about seeking out beauty in all of its different forms. You know, I think beauty is this thing that nudges us into a place where we're wondering about life and our place in it. It is something that pulls us toward it. It pulls us deeper into life. It makes us curious. And, you know, I think that it is this kind of optimistic, like, hell yes to what life has to offer. And it's, for me, it's just been such a gift to feel the way that art has opened me up to all of these new sources of beauty in the world around me. Well, speaking of new sources of beauty, new and unexpected encounters, we have to talk about Amanda Alfieri, a.k.a. Mandy Alfire. An extremely unexpected turn in this book. <laughs> Who is that? How did you find her? You talk about in the book, about there are many art worlds. This is actually an art world that is almost not a part of the art world as I know it and is like a totally new character in your book. <laughs> Glad I got to bring you somewhere new. It was new for me too. So Amanda Alfieri, she's on Instagram as at Thug Life Thick Baby, if anyone's interested in checking her out. Basically, my initial encounter with her came about because... I was at an opening at Catbox Contemporary, which is a gallery based out of a cat tree in an artist apartment in Queens. <laughs> and the artist... Yes, an ultra, ultra alternative <laughs> art space. Great, love it. And the artist that was showing it happened to invite me to Mandy Allfire's opening. And I didn't know anything about Mandy Allfire except what this artist had sent to me in a text, which was the press release. And according to the press release, Mandy Alfire had, uh, excuse the context, but she had an MFA from Columbia. She had performed in some of the most respected and celebrated arts venues in the country. And she had also, for the past several years, been performing as an ass influencer on Instagram. So your listeners are, of course, far too cultured to know what that is. I will explain it. An ass influencer is essentially an influencer who has attracted, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers for posting photos of her butt. And that is what Mandy had done. And so for the opening of her show, Mandy had invited her fans, which numbered in the hundreds of thousands, to come to the gallery for a live face sitting. And she was going to sit on their faces until, and I quote, they can't take it anymore. Now, I will confess, I read this press release and I was like, this is too much. Like, yes, I have come back from Miami craving sort of like weirder, more unexpected art, but we have gone too far. Like, this just feels like... Yeah, this might be a little too weird, too unexpected. too weird. Like, come on. Be reasonable. That being said, it was not every night that a real-life artist invited me to go with them to an opening. So I felt like, okay, like, the gauntlet has been thrown. I need to go. Maybe next time she'll invite me to something worthwhile. Let's see what this is all about. So I get there, get to the opening. The art is already happening. Mandy is sitting on a man's face. You know, if you can picture it, I mean, she's wearing sort of like all black lingerie. One of these guys was laid out in leopard print underwear and she's sort of like bouncing on his face like a mattress shopper texting the merchandise. And next thing I knew, they asked if anyone else wanted to be sat on and my hand went up. And soon after, just darkness descended. After this experience, I couldn't stop thinking about Mandy's work. Yes, this is really, um, I mean, it may sound like an outlandish detour, but we were just talking about beauty and transformative experiences. And this really troubled you, stuck in your head, opened up a whole series of doors totally. for you. I mean, look, I think part of it was like my process was immersive, her process was immersive. Meaning she had actually like transformed herself from being an artist into an actual ass influencer. Right. But she also saw what she was doing 
as art, right? And I think that is what really made me realize that there was a rather fundamental question that I couldn't answer, which is what is art? Now, I did not want to deal with this question. Again, this is another topic that through history, people have been wrestling over that I realized like, you know, I needed to figure it out. I needed to look into it for myself. And I was really surprised to understand the way that our idea of what art is today is really the product of a rather arbitrary decision made by status conscious Europeans in the 1760s to essentially elevate a handful of things to the status of fine art and dismiss everything else as craft, the sort of thing that, you know, is useful, but doesn't move our souls. And so we have this handful of things that we count as being fine art, right? Poetry, architecture, arts, painting, sculpture. And it used to be, on the other hand, that anything requiring human ingenuity and skill was considered art. Training horses, passing laws, carving marble. And I think that Amanda Alfieri's work as Mandy Alfire helped me begin to see art less as an object and more as a behavior. I think at the same time, like art is sort of in so many more places than we give it credit for being. Working with Amanda and also working with Julie Curtis, you know, I was really in awe of the way that these artists approached the everyday world with this art mindset. Like I think that they sort of could go out into the streets of New York or on Instagram, wherever it was, and sort of turn this art eye on the everyday with this willingness to sort of examine the form, ask why and how, to sort of ponder how mysterious and almost impossible these things that we take for granted in our everyday life are. And I think that's so exciting. That also began to be a pathway for me to really understand for myself why art is so necessary to the human experience. I think that context is such a tempting shortcut for us to rely on because in many ways, that's how our brains work. We do not look at the world like video cameras dispassionately recording the scenes around us. Our brains are really, in fact, trash compactors. We have these filters of expectation that descend to preemptively sort, dismiss, categorize, prioritize all the raw data coming in even before we get the full picture. So really like vision is a hallucination. It is a creation. It is a creative act when we see. And what scientists and also artists have come to agree on as one of the key reasons that art is so essential is that it helps us fight those reducing tendencies of our minds. It is not always pleasant, but it introduces these unexpected images and experiences that are essentially a glitch, right? It's a a glitch that is a gift. It's a glitch that can kind of hijack those filters of expectation and help our brains jump the curb, escape their well-worn pathways. And for that reason, I think the Mandy Elfire episode is really interesting one in the book because you start out going to galleries and being like, why are these vegetables on a mattress? Why are people moved by that? But then you go to this kind of like outre art show and then you're the one trying to convince people. Like you tried to put together an art show with her for the spring break art fair and, you know, got rejected. (laughs) So far. I mean, there's always time. So far, so far. It does kind of like speak to, like, I don't know if beauty is the right word for what you get out of that project. It's a much broader palette of human experience, which is about shaking up your expectations and even maybe about just asking you the question of just like, what is this experience I'm looking at? The other thing I want to say is actually... I have seen Amanda Alfieri perform, I realized, as I was reading your description. It's not an artist who will be a household name to a lot of people, but I saw her perform at the Abrams Art Center, the performance that you talked about, the How to Become a Performance Art performance, where she basically acts out the laws of becoming a performance art. You know, it has to have nudity, it has to have violence, and where she carved the word YOLO into her stomach with glass. I found it one of the most disturbing performances I've ever seen. I still think about it, you know, 10 years on. And specifically, I think about it representing a certain kind of desperation, this kind of like broken lower parts of the art world, this kind of sense that everything had been reduced to spectacle and the game was kind of rigged. And the only way in is kind of self-destructive, take out of the kind of corrupt institutions of art world and you come through them ennobled. But you turn it around and it's kind of 
a sad story in some of its dimensions about people barely scraping by and living on a dream. Even Julie Curtis, who's a fairly successful painter and trying to scrape together the money to figure out the right health insurance plan to have. Certainly an experience common to a lot of the artists you talk to. And I just wanted to note that about it because I think it documents a specific time and a specific conversation about how these institutions work, but also don't work. I appreciate that. I mean, look, I wanted the book to feel very nuanced. You know, I think that like, like the human experience, like there's agony and there's bliss. I will say at the outset, as I started, you know, at the very beginning, having conversations with people, I was surprised by how down on the art world so many people were that I spoke to. Yeah, They were in it and they were so dismissive of it. They were like, it's a fucking horror. It's a train crash. It's a giant con. I mean, just unload these really horrible things about it. And I would hear that and I was like, but you're all still here, right? Surely there's something worth celebrating. Like surely there's something that's keeping you here and a part of it, keeping you going. We'll also say that nothing gets a journalist's interest, like hinting that something is rotten to the core and then shutting up. And so of course that sort of twin dynamic of people being like, it's horrible and rotten but also we're not going to tell you anything about it, of course, only encouraged me to want to keep going, to get deeper inside. But I think at the same time, I was like, again, like, why does this matter? Why is this potentially, and I would argue, is essential to the human experience? And so it's been very gratifying in the time since the book has been published to hear from so many different people about how the book feels very true to them. That's really rewarding. I mean, I worked really hard to try and like capture these different elements of it. But I also hope that it is, like I said before, a celebration of really what makes this world special and incredible and valuable and so necessary to us as people. And I really mean people, right? All of us. I think my hope also is that someone like you that's spent years in this world picks up the book and discovers something new, but that someone who doesn't go to galleries and museums will read it and really feel inspired and excited to make art a part of their life. Maybe that's overly ambitious or maybe that's overly optimistic, but a girl can dream, can't she? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think that is as fine a place to end it as any. So many more questions, so many more amazing anecdotes in this book. People should look at the book. It's called Get the Picture. Bianca, thank you very much for talking with me about it. Thank you so much. Well, that is it for this week's episode. If you like what you've heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, please take a moment to rate and review our show. It will help other listeners discover what we're up to. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.